So what does this guy do? Or maybe what does this guy do? Or even what does this guy do? Well, that's what we'll be explaining in this video. What's up my friends? Welcome to a brand new video. In this one, I'm explaining kind of what soldiers do at different levels of enlisted rank. All right, so we're gonna be talking about some different enlisted ranks. I have a few demonstration ones here. If I don't have a demonstration one, there will probably be like a little pop-up somewhere of showing what the rank looks like and I'll explain it to you a little bit. But you're probably curious as to like, what do you do as a private? What do you do as a sergeant? What do you do as this rank, right? Only on the enlisted side, that's what we're gonna do. But without further ado, let's dive into it. And we're starting off with blank slate, all right? If you're an E1, you don't have any rank on your chest, on your uniform. It's just an empty Velcro or hook and fastener. It's, in a, it's a Velcro, all right? It's Velcro. You don't have any rank on your chest, anywheres. You're just a private. Well, those individuals, we should probably still bundle in with the E2s that actually does have something on their chest, little mosquito wings, your little kind of a chevron thing. I don't know, it's a, technically a private second class, but nobody calls it a private second class. They still get called privates. Basically, your E1s and E2s, for the most part, get treated practically the same. These soldiers are stuck doing whatever, all right? If there is some crappy detail, if there is missions that need to be done, these soldiers are stuck doing it. You basically have to earn your keep, right? You're brand new in the army. You have no experience. So you have to build that experience. The only way you're going to build experience is by doing things and doing the crappy details, doing the good details, whatever the case is, that's how you build experience. So those E1s and E2s, you just kind of get stuck with the crappy end of the stick. You get stuck with all the crappy details, all the work. Anytime they need someone to go do something, they're probably looking to the lower enlisted guys for sure. If they need more than that, then probably grab more. But sometimes they alternate too with other, other ranks as well. So, you know, but definitely expect that you're going to have to do a lot of crappy stuff for a while until you kind of build up in rank. Now, when you build up to an E3 or a private first class, which I don't have one of those, so it's on the screen, but that does get a little bit better. You may not notice it, but it does get a little bit better. You're probably not the first choice for them to go and send off to a crappy detail unless you happen to be just a crappy soldier because sometimes it doesn't matter what your rank is. If you're someone that just messes things up all the time, well, the NCOs wanna make sure that you kind of learn from that and try to get better so you are still gonna stuck with all the crappy details. But if you are proving yourself, you're working hard and you're doing the best that you possibly can, then they might try to, you know, give more of the crappy details to those still privates and everything like that. And the private first class, the E3, may be able to slide out of a few of those. But you still don't have a whole lot of authority. You don't have a whole lot of responsibilities as a private first class. It's a little bit better than a private, like an E1, E2, but not a whole lot more. It does actually get a little bit better when you get to this guy. When you move up to an E4 or a specialist, it does actually start to get a little bit better. Now you get a little bit more responsibility. Now you're probably the babysitter for the privates, sure, but you actually have a little bit more responsibility now. You might be more of the go-to individual to do the more important missions, the ones that they really need someone reliable. If you were someone really reliable as a private too, you could have ended up in that situation, but hopefully at this point, you know, your specialist individuals are the ones that are kind of the more reliable individuals and the ones that they're gonna count on to get things done. Some examples of that is, let's say, like in my MOS, right? And as an ADA Mike, the specialists that actually have proven themselves and everything like that, I may trust them a little bit more to kind of look after the privates. Again, kind of going back to the babysitter thing, I guess. But we might look up to them a little bit better to, you know, making sure that, you know, things get accomplished, right? So I might give the taskings out to those specialists or someone who's a higher ranking specialist to say, hey, these are the things we got to get done. Uh, can you see to it that, you know, things are, are happening and, you know, have someone so help you get so and so to do this, so and so to do that. So you have a little bit more authority. Probably often you're not doing as much of the crappy details. You might still have it. And definitely if you're a messed up, jacked up E4 specialist that is, not very reliable, then you might get stuck with a lot of the crappy details. But if you are reliable and pretty good, then it might be limited. You might get none, you might only get a few here and there. It might just kind of vary on the leadership and the unit. So things do kind of get better here. I mean, people have the E4 Mafia, the Sham Shield, right? A lot of times because the privates are getting stuck with all the crappy things and the specialists aren't having to do all those crappy things. So they're like, oh man, specialist so-and-so gets a sham out of this one. Well, they've built their way up to their rank a little bit. So yeah, they kind of earned it a little bit. Now we should probably mention E4 Corporal, all right? For the most part, it's only a little bit more authority than the specialist in a lot of cases, not always, but in some cases, sure, they kind of 
I like this in between of a specialist and a sergeant. Sometimes they task them with tasks that normally would be done by a sergeant. Sometimes they might task them with things that would be done by a specialist. They're kind of almost like both ranks. They're almost like a sergeant and a specialist in some ways, and they feel like, hey, we can just give this guy, you know, both of these jobs. They might be things like, you know, they're like, hey, that soldier's a corporal, so let's go ahead and have them, you know, lead this team, or let's have them take care of this, you know, this guard duty thing or whatever, and be in charge of them or whatever. But then sometimes you're just stuck doing regular old specialist stuff, and even though you're not getting paid extra for it, you have more responsibility with it. That does definitely vary. I mean, there's probably some like infantry units and certain combat arms units where corporal does get a little bit more authority, almost more like your sergeants in certain other units. But definitely, you know, it does depend on the unit, depend on the leadership. Now, once you do finally move up this guy to your sergeant, now you do actually have a little bit more authority, but you also have, you know, more responsibility. So now you're possibly like a team leader. Maybe even, you know, after you've been a sergeant for a while, you might even be a squad leader. It just kind of depends on your unit, at who they have, what they're short on. Because there's often cases too where you have a sergeant that's been a sergeant for a while. So they might be a section sergeant. They might be a squad leader, whatever the case is. But now you know you have authority, right? You are probably more of the person that has to tell the soldiers what to do. You're less of the worker bee now. I mean, not always, but less of the worker bee and more of your supervisor kind of a role. And a lot of people, you know, especially when they're new sergeants, they try to kind of play both fields. You're like, oh, I'm not gonna be one of those NCOs that just watch, you know, over what's going on or whatever. And they try to get more active with doing things. But after a while, they start to find out that, hey, if I'm really tied up with working on this with the soldiers, I can't keep track of what these other soldiers are having to do over in this other area, and now they're just kind of off roaming free. So sometimes you do have to balance that out. Sometimes you have to do a little bit of work, you know, with the soldiers to pull your weight a little bit and kind of, you know, not seem like you're lazy or whatever the case is. And sometimes you do need to, you know, just kind of step up and to be that leadership position and check on soldiers, make sure they're doing the right things. Maybe make sure they're doing things right the right way so we don't have to do it a second or third time. But especially while you're new, right, you're still kind of stuck in that mentality like maybe you were as a specialist where you want to get your hands dirty and get into the work. And that's that's fine, right? That's okay to do, but you can't let it get in the way of also being a leader and also making sure that your other soldiers that you're responsible for are doing the right thing. So now you're like put in charge of some soldiers. Like I said, maybe you have like three, four soldiers, maybe more. It just kind of depends. That's usually kind of a common range, you know, especially for a new sergeant to maybe have like three or four soldiers that are kind of like a part of their team that you probably now have to do counseling statements for, for monthly ones, as well as if they do negatively, then you have to write that counseling statement for them. And you have to, you know, maybe conduct some training with some soldiers and lead the training. And you might be in charge of like some guard duties and different kind of tasks like that. Also some crappy ones too, sometimes you get stuck being in charge of a crappy detail, you get stuck being in charge of the CQ, you know, being the 24 hour duty at the barracks and being the one in charge of one or two other soldiers that are your runners and making sure the barracks are fine. Now, when you do move up to staff sergeant, it does seem like a little bit of a good increase, right? Now you should not be anywhere close to the same level as these guys, really. I'm mean, not, not saying like put them down kind of a thing. I'm, sorry, I'm talking about as far as like, you know, responsibility wise and what you're gonna be doing. Now you're probably like a section sergeant, maybe even in some cases, if you've been a staff sergeant for a while and they're short on certain people, you might even be a platoon sergeant. So now you're in charge of more soldiers. Maybe now you're in charge of like 10, 20 soldiers. It kind of just depends on the makeup of your platoon, what unit you're in, your MOS, all that kind of stuff like that. But now you have a lot more responsibility. Now you're more looked up to and you are gonna be the go-to NCO for getting a lot of training done. Because the next one up from here, right, they're probably like the platoon sergeant, so you're like the next one in line. Platoon sergeants, which I'll talk about in a little bit, are more of your ones that are kind of looking over the big picture for the platoon and handing down the tasks to these staff sergeants to make sure that the platoon is carrying them out. These, these individuals are the ones making it happen, right? They're the ones that have been told what we have to accomplish, what has to get done, and making sure it gets you know seen through to get accomplished. These are also sometimes your drill sergeants, right? You can have drill sergeants here too, but most commonly, you know, here is where you want the drill sergeants, but in situations where they are shorthanded on drill sergeants or certain people volunteer for it sometimes, then, you know, you can be drill sergeants here, but this is more, more of your common one. Also recruiting as well. So your recruiters are often the staff sergeant, this E6. So then from here, it then moves on to an E7, which is a sergeant first class. Those individuals are typically your uh, platoon sergeants. 
your sergeant first classes are the ones receiving the the information from like the first sergeant for the company or the troop or whatever. And they're the ones that have to make sure that tasks are getting done and it gets delegated properly. It kind of definitely goes down like a sequential kind of order, right? Rank kind of, kind of starts to go downhill of, you know, who's in, next in line for dishing out the orders and making sure things get done. But your platoon sergeants are the ones that are receiving it directly from like your first sergeant. First sergeant's like, hey, we got to get this thing done, you know, as far as, you know, where we want to be as a whole company or a troop or whatever. And the platoon sergeants at their levels are the ones that are attending the meetings to talk about how it's going to get done and kind of get the taskings and, you know, kind of divvy things up. So a lot of responsibility at E7. When you're at that sergeant first class, you're, you're uh, you know, kind of, kind of a big deal and uh, you kind of have to, you know, really step it up, definitely. Sometimes even sergeant first classes have to fill in often as maybe the first sergeant, right? If they are the higher ranking sergeant first class and the first sergeant is gone somewhere or whatever the case is, they may end up being like the acting first sergeant. Now, however, if that company or whatever has a master sergeant, then that one is most likely the individual that will kind of fill in as the uh, acting first sergeant when the first sergeant is gone. Master sergeant is the next rank up, your E8s. But your E8s can also be the first sergeant. But first, let's talk about the master sergeants. Your master sergeant is probably going to be like, I've seen cases where they are in charge of the motor pool, right? They're the individual that is in charge of all of the motor pool, right? So they're in charge of the maintenance people, in charge of anybody else, and they're also overall responsible for the motor pool as a whole. Kind of tasked down from the first sergeant, right? Obviously the first sergeant is the one in charge of everything, but then it gets kind of delegated down to the master sergeant. The master sergeant may be like the motor sergeant or whatever kind of term they may use, and that person is kind of in charge of that. Master sergeants can also be more in like staff roles. I mean, a lot of these roles, I mean, really like this staff sergeant could be in a staff role. The sergeant first class can be in a staff role. But if your master sergeant isn't like usually like in a maintenance section or certain other kind of roles, usually they're working at staff level. So that means they're working at like that brigade or battalion level. Different things like they could be like the training NCO, right? They could be the person that's in charge of making sure that the unit is getting the proper training they're supposed to be getting and scheduling the training through the proper channels to make sure that we have everything planned out for the field exercise or classes coming up or whatever. So they could potentially even be like the training NCO. That could even still be a staff sergeant though or a sergeant first class. But hopefully at some point that master sergeant is hoping to become a first sergeant as that first sergeant is usually in charge of that troop or that company or that battery, depending on you know what type of unit it is, they're the senior NCO for that unit level. So again, kind of going back to how things kind of stair step down, right? These are the individuals that are probably receiving information as a whole from like the sergeant major, right? So they're getting the taskings as far as how the mission needs to be accomplished at each company, troop, battery level and it gets handed down to the first sergeants to kind of relay, hey, this troop or this company or battery is gonna be in charge of you know, getting this part of the mission done, this other one's gonna be in charge of this part of the mission, and so on and so forth. So they're handing these missions down to them, and then it's up to the first sergeant to then kind of divvy that work up between the platoons to make sure that as a whole, we can accomplish the mission. Someone might be in that first sergeant role usually for maybe like a year, maybe two years, it just depends. Uh, often you don't wanna have a first sergeant in charge of that specific you know, troop, company, or battery for too long because then, I don't know, things kinda of get complicated a little bit in some ways. So typically a year, maybe two years, you usually don't have a first sergeant being in charge of that same troop or company or battery for that long, right? Before they either move on to another one or they move up in position because that next level up is a sergeant major. That sergeant major could also probably be like in a staff position. That one is usually like maybe the sergeant major for the S3, which is like, you know, the Intel individuals or they're in charge of a whole, you know, major kind of a thing. Not to be confused with the command sergeant major, which we'll talk about that in a little bit, but that sergeant major, typically that's more of a staff kind of role. When you're a sergeant major and not a command sergeant major, you're working somewhere as a battalion, at brigade, maybe at division or whatever, in some kind of you know main senior NCO role, but not at the level where you're a command sergeant major that's in charge of a larger unit. Sergeant majors that I've seen are like someone that's in charge of like the S3, like I gave that example. I've seen a sergeant major where they are in charge of the training, but for the training for that entire, you know, unit, right? So if they're, you know, a battalion level maybe, right? Then that is the battalion uh, training NCO or maybe the battalion schools NCO or whatever could be that sergeant major in some cases. 
but usually it's some sort of staff position. There's somewhere working up at brigade or up at battalion or maybe up at division doing something really important. And eventually if they, you know, are selected, then they become a command sergeant major. So now they're in command, I guess you can kind of say, of a unit. That is usually done at that brigade level or that battalion level or that division level, post level even, right? Technically actually post is lower than division. So if I, did I say division before that? But division would be actually be one of the higher ones and then garrison command or the garrison sergeant major is like the post sergeant major. But those are your individuals usually that are command sergeant majors. They have a high responsibility over that battalion, that division, whatever the case is. Obviously those individuals probably wanna work up to the high responsibility of being a division command sergeant major. Very, you know, important individual, making a lot of important, you know, kind of decisions, working alongside with, you know, whatever that, you know, probably like a general, like if they're at a division level, then they probably have someone that is the division commander, which is probably like a general. That individual may be like, like you know, two star, three star, whatever the case might be. So the different are your different levels of that command sergeant major. It could be a battalion, brigade, division, garrison sergeant major. That garrison sergeant major though, is almost more like a mayor, right? I mean, you're, they're working alongside with the garrison commander, which might be like a one star or two star or something along those lines, uh, just depending on the size of the installation and the size of the units and everything like that. But they're kind of like the mayor. They're not really like in charge of the entire units that are on that installation. They are in charge of that post. So they do have say so as far as like policies that go into place with that post and all the kind of stuff that go into effect on that installation but they are not in charge of those different units. The, that comes down to the division sergeant majors, the division commanders for those levels, and those ones kind of you know work with a higher up from bigger army stuff. So garrison sergeant major, garrison commander, post commander, post command sergeant major, those individuals are more like your mayors that are kind of in charge of policies and everything with that installation and in charge of that installation, but not the units necessarily. So uh, I think that kind of gives a good summary as far as, you know, what this guy does and this guy does and this guy does and all that stuff like that. You might want to know, like, at what level do you start getting more leadership? What does this individual do when you get, once you get to that rank? There are probably a ton of other examples, right? I'm just kind of shooting from the hip as far as some of the examples I gave you. There are a ton more examples. Don't think that just because I didn't mention a specific example that that's not something that exists or whatever. No, I, I just didn't mention it. There's a ton of examples that probably could be out there. So there are a lot of different levels as far as responsibilities. This is just to give you a general idea of some potential possibilities, all right? It's not the end all be all example. And if I didn't mention it, then it's not a thing that happens at that rank. No, I'm just giving you some good examples for your curiosity, individuals, especially that want to join the army and you're wondering at what stage, what rank do I start doing this? Or do I start doing that? If you have questions as far as, you know, hey, what rank does this? Or what rank does that? Just leave those down in the comments. Either I'll try to respond to you. I'm sure there's a ton of like other veterans or people that are currently in the military that might be able to respond to you and maybe let you know. Maybe you want to know, you know, what at what level do I, you know, Know, get to you know move off base or whatever the case is right and if if you really want to know that I mean typically it's usually right right around here sometimes in some cases with units depending on how full the barracks are otherwise you have to move up to the next one at starting first class unless you're married of course but again there are a ton of other examples so hopefully you enjoy that and you get a good little kind of understanding as far as an idea of what people do what soldiers do at different ranks at different levels now, if you want to see the video that started all the magic of this channel, right here. I have a video that I did a long time ago, back in 2017, that talked about enlisted rank, and that's the video that made this channel what it is today. At some point in time, I'm probably going to update that and do a better version, but check it out. If you haven't seen that already, probably that's the reason why you're subscribed to the channel, maybe. Check out my latest upload right there. Link's down in the description. As always, I'm Christopher Chaos. Thanks for hanging out. I'll see you next time. See ya.